Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in this webinar. My name is Zach Gardner. I'm a senior solutions architect with the Amazon Elastikash team, and I'm incredibly excited to present building modern microservice architectures with Amazon Elastikash. I spend a lot of my time working with customers who are adopting microservice architectures, and Amazon Elastikash can often play a critical role in helping those architectures come together. So I'm excited to share some example patterns that we've seen, as well as drivers and reasons why customers are moving their applications away from monolithic software architectures into microservices. And then we'll get into some demonstrations so you can understand exactly how some of these pieces come together. So thanks so much for joining. Just a little bit around the agenda. So as mentioned, monolith to microservices. Why are organizations moving traditional software stacks and monolithic architectures into microservices? We'll dive a little bit deeper on architectural components. So what are the core foundational pieces of microservice architectures? And then more specifically, we'll focus on how Amazon Elasticash, which is a managed version of Redis technology, will give you the ability to implement some well-known patterns, some which have been historically leveraged even outside of microservices architectures, but also how these can be implemented, keeping in context that you're going to be leveraging microservices in your architecture. So we'll look at stateful sessions, caching in a traditional sense, but also caching with additional patterns like event sourcing. And then even more interesting is when you have all these different microservices talking to one another, how can Amazon Elasticash be leveraged in order to accommodate service to service communication? So we'll look a little bit deeper at that pattern. Then we'll get into a demonstration. I just have a very simple microservices based application built on EKS, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service to be able to understand how these pieces come together in a real uh, UI that you can touch and feel. And we'll look at how some of the components such as the API can consume Amazon Elasticash for Redis and which data structures within Redis are being leveraged in order to accommodate these use cases. Then we'll look very briefly at some additional areas where we've seen Redis be used within microservices architectures and areas where you can learn more, such as getting started with deploying Amazon Elasticash in your AWS cloud. So first, let's talk about some reasons or drivers why customers are adopting microservices architectures. And it really starts out with the traditional limitations of monolithic applications. If all of your code and all of your application is bound by a single node or a single piece of hardware or a single monolith or database, it can be very hard to scale because inevitably all of those things have to scale together and then they have to understand how to communicate even if they're capable of scaling. So within that same code base then, if you think about those component failures, those are isolated to that same monolith in order to make sure that your applications are running and more resilient if a, if a failure occurs within the monolithic architecture, it can be very difficult to diagnose and fixing one area can often impact uh, another piece of functionality within the monolith. And then within there, you, you may have limited options in terms of technology decisions that you can make in order to encapsulate an entire application into a monolith because it has to be able to do many things. So when we look at microservices architectures, we'll discuss how tech, technology independent decisions can be made in order to isolate your service and allow technology to drive what that service does best. And finally, if you think about being able to test and integrate and deploy a monolithic architecture, that includes a lot of dependencies, which can slow down the deployment process and keep teams from being productive and, and really being able to drive innovation within their areas of functionality. So these are hopefully some areas where you can understand what it takes in order to move off of monolithic applications and into microservices architectures or reasons why customers are making the change. So what is a, a microservice and how does this 
compared to a monolithic architecture. So first off, a microservice is tightly scoped. It is strongly encapsulated, it's loosely coupled, it's independently deployable, and it's a scalable application service. And in order to develop and deploy microservices, organizations are using techniques such as service-oriented architecture or domain-driven design. And a monolith or a, micro, a macro service if you will, is a tightly coupled, single tiered application in which the user interface and data are combined into a single program for a single platform. And it is self-contained and is independent from other computing applications. So if you think about having to share information outside of the monolith, that can become a, another issue which you might avoid by adopting a um, microservice architecture. Now, there is something in between, though not yet widely adopted, called mini services. And often organizations will call a microservice something that is actually a mini service. And a mini service is a coarse grained, loosely coupled, independently deployable, and independently scalable application component. It is similar to a microservice, except that it is coarser granularity and more relaxed independence constraints, meaning many services can share a database unlike uh, microservices, but it's still independently deployable, whereas most macro services are deployed in monolithic packages. So somewhere along this spectrum, you achieve greater resiliency, greater scalability, as well as more choice as it relates to the technology decisions that you make. So in our presentation today, we'll focus more on microservices architectures. However, it is worthwhile to keep in context that some organizations are making these changes in a bit more gradual sense. So it's important to keep that in context as well. So by now you might be starting to understand what the drivers to switch to microservices might be. So we talked about reducing time to market by allowing teams to focus on their functional areas. And within that ownership comes a reduction in the time to repair errors and configurations within these packages because they are loosely coupled. They are much smaller in nature. So if teams own that, that entire service, there's, very, there's much less surface area that they need to be responsible for, which also allows them to drive innovation in order to introduce new changes around the, the bounded context that they own. So this enables hyperscaling because the services, if loosely coupled, can increase or decrease their resource utilization and consumption. And certain container orchestration platforms like Kubernetes or serverless Lambda or even Elastic Container Service on AWS give you the ability to scale these compute layers much more seamlessly. And finally, technology independent, meaning if I have a, a data model, for instance, within my service, and I know that I'm only ever going to do simple put get operations, I may not require a traditional relational database system or service, for instance. Instead, I may be better suited with a NoSQL or a document object database. So these are just ways in which the microservices architecture unlocks operational benefits as well as technology uh, freedom of choice within your development teams. So having introduced microservices to a point where you understand the value, some of the concepts and reasons and drivers why customers are moving, now I'd like to talk briefly about Amazon Elasticast for Redis as a fully managed in-memory cache in the cloud, which gives you choice as far as how to access your data with low latency in-memory access using a variety of Redis data structures, which we'll touch on many in this presentation because they help power some of these microservices architectures. But before I do that, I want to, of course, touch on AWS purpose-built databases. As mentioned, these microservices architectures give you a lot of choice in how you deploy your services as well as the underlying data stores, which are used to hold the data that the service owns. So depending on your requirements, what your service needs to do, you can choose from a variety of database engines available on AWS, as an example. So you see relational databases for traditional OLTP transactional applications, or key value for Amazon DynamoDB, Cloud Native NoSQL database, or document objects to store uh, something such as content management within Amazon DocumentDB, 
A lot of our focus today, of course, will be on Amazon Elasticash and particularly Amazon Elasticash for Redis is fully managed in memory cloud offering, and then even more purpose-built databases, depending on the type of service you're building, like a recommendation engine where you need to chart relationships or social networking between various users. Amazon Neptune as a fully managed graph database would work quite well. And then Amazon Timestream or QLDB for cryptographically verifiable transactions running in a ledger database, or even wide column stores such as Amazon Key Spaces for Apache Cassandra compatibility. So again, the microservices architecture gives you a lot of choice, which enables you to choose from purpose-built databases to accommodate in the best way your application requirements and the data that it needs to store. So hopefully by now you're seeing that you're no longer locked into even a monolithic relational database architecture. Instead, you only choose that when you have the requirements that are best suited. So what is Amazon Elasticash for Redis? Well, it's a fully managed AWS in-memory service, which takes care of write and memory scaling with sharding and non-disruptive scaling operations and allows you to read scale with replicas. AWS manages all hardware and software setup configuration and monitoring. And this is really a great choice when you have in-memory data requirements and cache for sub-millisecond response times. So when we look at some of our architectures here today, we're going to be looking at data, which is required to be returned extremely fast. So when we look at some of the patterns, you'll understand that if you're making calls from a, a front facing web application, you don't want to disrupt the user experience by introducing additional latency for data access. So Amazon Elasticash works as that in memory data storing cache to support the most demanding applications requiring sub millisecond response times by utilizing an end to end optimized stack running on customer dedicated nodes and Amazon Elasticash provides you secure blazing fast performance while maintaining OSS compatibility with Redis open source. So just in case you're new to Redis, I want to briefly touch on some of the capabilities. So it's available as a fully managed service on Amazon Elasticash and it provides in-memory data structures such as strings and lists and sets and sorted sets and hashes and streams. And we'll look in greater detail at a few of these data structures to support our microservices architectures. However, just from an administration perspective, Redis achieves high availability through replication. So you'll have a, maybe a single primary node with many replicas to support additional read scalability as well as multi-AZ failover targets. And that scalability can also be extended on the right side through sharding. So introducing additional primary nodes and breaking up the cache in order to scale out your workload and scale in when required. And then Redis achieves persistence through snapshot or store, as well as the replication and, and the failover that it, it can achieve. And it also allows you to do multi-key atomic operations. So depending on the requirements in your microservices architecture, for instance, if you need to update many keys at once, you can do this through Redis transactions or even through additional server-side processing, such, in, such as a Lewis script, as an example. So hopefully this provides a little bit about the Redis engine. As mentioned, it's available as open source and running fully managed on Amazon Elasticash. So now that we've dove deep into drivers and reasons why customers are moving their applications to microservices architectures, we talked a little bit around technology independent decisions to help power these microservices architectures. And we introduced Amazon Elasticash for Redis as an in-memory, low latency data store and cache for the most demanding applications. Now we're gonna look at some patterns and we'll take this first at a high level perspective of how you build microservices powered applications on AWS. And then we'll look specifically at some patterns where we've seen Redis be adopted, keeping in mind even some of the more well-known use cases for Redis such as session store and a cache. So we'll look at how that gets implemented within these microservices architectures. And then of course, we'll get into demonstration coming up here in about, let's say 20 minutes where we'll look at how this stuff all comes together. So if we look at 
an example microservices architecture, there's really few big ticket items. If you, if you think about how the web user, for instance, let's say this is a web-based application, how this user is going to communicate with various layers of the microservice as it's broken up and distributed across many services. So the first is you have the browser and these are mobile clients, for instance, or desktop web applications where you're interacting with a front facing, maybe HTML web page. And one way that that front facing HTML can be deployed is of course, through Amazon S3 static web pages and Amazon CloudFront for distributing that content across AWS global infrastructure. But eventually you'll, you'll start needing to make API requests and implement server side logic. So one way that you can do this is by introducing an application load balancer. So a load balancer will allow you to scale various service services within your microservices architecture in order to accommodate greater resource utilization. So uh, one way that you can increase and decrease the amount of compute available to your microservices is to leverage a container orchestration platform. And one example of this would be Amazon EKS to run Kubernetes-based workloads, or even API, API Gateway on AWS, or even AWS Lambda, or Amazon ECS, Elastic Container Service. But for our choices here, we just chose Amazon EKS for that management layer on top of the Kubernetes workload. So this can run various pods and pods will be able to deploy containers. So in my specific example, I happen to leverage Amazon ECR and ECR is a way, Elastic Container Registry is a way for me to store container images securely on AWS. And traditionally these containers are built using CI CD pipelines. So this allows me to build, deploy and test and integrate my code into container images, which are then accessible to my container orchestration platform. So in my case, Kubernetes. And then these applications, because they are largely stateless services, need to have some sort of database component. And in my case, I'm leveraging Amazon Elasticache as a cache to offload reads and writes from a, another data store, in this case, a cloud native NoSQL database, which you may know as Amazon DynamoDB. And now I can independently scale my services as well as have the power to scale DynamoDB or Amazon Elasticash to accommodate my application. Now, it's important to keep in context, there are other components which are worthwhile to, to mention here. This is not necessarily a, a deep dive on building end-to-end -end microservices architectures, but very briefly, you also want to consider things like DNS-based service discovery and third, maybe even third-party software or proxies, which may become useful in helping distribute and centralize some of the logging or auditing associated with some of these architectures and even looking at other mechanisms like service meshes, such as AWS App Mesh. So these are all just important considerations. And even in the context of microservices architectures, we're gonna look at event sourcing and how event sourcing enables decoupling different parts of an application by using such something such as a publish subscribe pattern and feeding event data across many services here. So right now I only have really represented by the, the Amazon EKS icon, a single microservice. But as we get into the patterns, we're gonna see how these services can start to communicate and actually share data, maybe even beyond what's stored in their own primary data store, which they, what they happen to own, in my case, DynamoDB and Amazon Elasticash. So let's look at some use cases and patterns where we see Amazon Elasticash being leveraged for microservices architectures in greater detail here. So first, we, we really want our microservices to be stateless. And stateless means that I can add and remove pods or uh, instances to power these stateless services. And then I want to be able to maintain state somewhere else that is independent. So how do I bring state to my services without creating tightly coupled data and compute 
but also not introduce latency by having to fetch and retrieve data constantly from maybe a traditional disk-based database. So the first example pattern that I want to talk through is session store. And this is, of course, an extremely popular use case as it relates to Amazon Elasticash, even in traditional SOA service-oriented architectures. So here we have a user, and the user will be interacting with a web page. And that web page will be interacting with maybe a load balancer, which is proxying requests across many web tier nodes, such as pods or uh, various deployments on uh, Kubernetes. So we have our web tier here, web tier running on EKS as maybe replica container images of our, of our website. It's just a, a simplistic example, of course. And we want the user to have a consistent experience. We want them to share session across maybe devices or across a time of day or browser, for instance. So one thing that we can do is leverage Amazon Elasticash for Redis or even actually Amazon Elasticash for Memcached as a session management layer that allows the user to get and post their sessions without introducing a lots of latency or constraining database by making frequent requests to the underlying data store. So in our case, since this is a simple put get operation, we don't have to do anything too fancy as far as introducing asynchronous patterns for session store. I think we're comfortable with this being synchronous, such as I want to get from a particular data resource and wait for the response. But we're going to look at some additional patterns as well, which introduce more of an asynchronous communication between many services. But here, this is very simple. We have our web page, we have our sessions, our sessions are being posted and, and retrieved from Amazon Elasticash from our web tier EKS nodes. And we could further isolate this down into even more granular services, but for sake of argument to get started here, let's keep it simple with, with this architecture. So the value that this unlocks, of course, is if one of our web tier nodes goes down, if we choose to reduce the amount of pods, let's say in our Kubernetes cluster that are powering this workload, then the sessions are not disrupted because we're still retrieving those from that distributed in-memory cache on Amazon Elasticash without introducing that additional latency. So this is a, a very familiar use case, especially if you're coming from a Redis background. So next, I wanted to get into some maybe more interesting caching and data store related use cases, which can help power microservices architectures using Amazon Elasticash. So first, I'll start with, of course, caching. And we, we talk a lot about various caching patterns, such as the read through strategy and the write through strategy. For purposes of our discussion today, we have, uh, let's say, a, a web tier, which is talking to an API gateway. And that API gateway is responsible for the profile service. And in our case, this profile service could be hosted really anywhere, Lambda or ECS or EKS or honestly, even EC2. So you have the ability to encapsulate all the profile related logic into a single service. So the traditional caching use case would be maybe I want to insert into to my database and I also want to insert into my cache and I can use this, do this using SQL, such as insert into SQL using Amazon RDS for Postgres as an example. And then I use maybe a hash data structure on Amazon Elasticash for Redis and I can set various fields within my hash using hset. So this is honestly nothing too new if you've worked with caching architectures before. However, if you're new to caching, this is a really great way to ensure that data that you populate into your cache is kept in sync by doing like a parallel write between your cache and primary data store. So this would represent maybe the, the historical way that you would do caching without introducing any asynchronous communication into the architecture. But what if you wanted to decouple the cache and the writing to the cache from 
the end-to-end -end architecture. So instead of synchronously populating the cache, I may also have the ability to introduce more of a stream. And a stream would allow me to expose various events associated with my profile microservice into other services. And this could be uh, the caching service, this could be an analytics service. It really gives me the opportunity to open up communication as far as what's being written and read to the profile service without kind of creating lots of additional traffic or dependencies within the service itself. So if we walk through this architecture here, we again have our load balancer service, which is maybe talking to API gateway related Kubernetes pods. And one request that we can allow is maybe creating a profile or reading a profile for a user on a web application, as an example. And we'll call this profile the profile microservice. And what it's going to do is it, it's going to write to one location and it also is going to attempt to read from a different location. So if you've worked with microservices architectures before, you might recognize this as a CQRS pattern where I'm writing to a, a single data store and I'm reading maybe to a separate, more scalable data store. And again, this is just a, a sample pattern. We've seen various combinations of read and write data stores and only just are doing this as an example. So you have a, a, your primary profile microservice, which is writing an item to, in our case, DynamoDB. And at the same time, it's emitting an event, and that event is going to be written into a, what's called a Redis stream. And we'll get into more detail on Redis stream coming up in a moment. But we're gonna run the X add command to add to our profile event stream which can be written and retrieved from Amazon Elasticash for Redis. And then as we introduce streams, we'll talk about concepts such as consumer groups can be used to read events off of this profile event stream and then really introduce their own service logic in order to accommodate whatever they want to happen when a profile gets created as an example. So in our case, we have an event broker and this event broker could be responsible for populating the cache, which means I now have the opportunity to break up how my data stores are reading and writing data. Now, this is a really great way to improve the amount of scalability within my architecture, as well as onboard new services into the future, just by plugging them into the event broker and implementations of these event brokers vary. So keeping that out of scope for now, but we're using Amazon Elasticash for Redis as a mechanism to store these streams. And these streams can now be consumed by a variety of, of applications. So this is maybe a more traditional caching use case, leveraging some of the more asynchronous capabilities of microservices architectures. So, so far we've kind of looked at just services encapsulated in of themselves. We haven't really seen a way to have services communicate. So in the next session of the presentation, that's where I wanna focus some of our time. So let's look at this, this one concept, which is service to service communication. And one really interesting data structure, which is available on Amazon Elasticash for Redis is called the Redis stream. And the Redis stream is an append only log data structure, which allows you to collect large volumes of data arriving in high velocity and allows you to create use cases such as message brokers or message queues or web activity tracking, or in our case where we're gonna leverage it is, is as an event stream. So allowing various microservices to communicate with one another using a, a distributed in-memory data store such as Amazon Elasticash for Redis. So if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about what a stream is and how it works. So it, as I mentioned, it's an append only log data structure, which provides the, the log of events in sequential order and allows you to read and write data to the stream using concepts such as producers, which create records on the stream and consumers or consumer groups, which coordinate reads from the stream. So if you think about services and you want them to be asynchronous and you want them to be fault independent, 
if you omit these events, such as the profile created event that we looked at in our example, then we're not dependent necessarily on all of the various services to be available at any given point in time. Instead, we just populate the stream. And then when our services come back online, they can actually consume data off of the stream. They're not synchronously being communicated between services. So let's look at our example in, in our demo application coming up here in a second of how this can be accommodated. So here's our, our use case. We have, let's say, some an order service, and the order service is responsible for storing and owning the creation of orders. And then we have the delivery service. So the delivery service, of course, is responsible for understanding what orders are created and then running its own logic to understand how it's actually going to get uh, those deliveries to the end user. So the workflow here is API gateway being used to create an order to the order service. And the order service is still going to store its own orders. And you can introduce Amazon Elasticash as a way to cache orders such as a, a user's last order or uh, the top orders for a particular customer as examples. But the, the interesting part is then, okay, so you've created an order and the order service is going to emit an event. And it's going to emit an event to Amazon Elasticash for Redis stream. And then you would say, okay, well, uh, now what? So the, the delivery microservice can consume data off of the stream. So because the Amazon Elasticash for Redis is being used as that, almost like an event broker, I now have the ability to decentralize how information is, is communicated from the different services. So the order service creates an event which talks to Amazon Elasticash, and then the delivery microservice will consume that event, which means that if for some reason in my requirements the delivery service goes down, I can still process orders, and then when the delivery service comes back up, it can then read data off of the stream to process the created orders. And then I just so happened to uh, allow the delivery service to then create its own stream, which says, hey, this order is done or this order is processed successfully, or there was an exception case, for instance, and I can retrieve that information directly from the delivery microservice, but the order microservice might also be interested in that data. So I have the ability to plug in the order service into that event stream. So how does this scale? Well, it scales by allowing you to increase the number of services which would actually consume that data. So instead of building uh, various use cases into the same service, we introduce this idea of a consumer group, which is capable of reading data off of the stream in separate manner than maybe the traditional delivery microservice. So same workflow here, we have API Gateway, which is creating an order to the order service. Order service is storing that information and then emitting an event to Amazon Last Cache for Redis. And then we have a delivery microservice, which, which we've used before, but this time we're scaling it out to many, many pods. And the delivery consumer group, which is associated with these pods, is actively picking up items off of the stream and allowing me to improve the amount of scalability of the delivery service. And also what I can do is introduce new consumer groups. In my case, I might have an analytics microservice, which is just responsible for uh, ingesting these profile events for some downstream analytical processing. So this is just an example of how you start to see these event streams being able to be leveraged across a variety of business requirements and microservices. So hopefully this provides a, a good scope of how this communication can take place. What are some data structures I can use to leverage this? And there are other data structures within Amazon Elasticash for Redis and Redis in general that can accommodate different use cases. But in my case, it, it made a lot of sense to, to leverage streams in this, in this example. So now I wanted to go into a demo and the demo will 
and do exactly what, what we've been building on so far. So we talked around session store. So we'll have an API gateway, which is talking to a session store microservice, which is using Amazon Elastic Cash for Redis as an underlying data store to process session related information with low latency in memory access. And then we also have our API gateway, which is able to create orders or create profiles. And within those services, they'll be emitting events into Amazon Elastic Cash for Redis being used more as an event store, as well as a way to store information such as in a cache fashion for, uh, for in our case, the profile microservice. So we'll walk through all this in, in greater detail within the demonstration, but just wanted to provide a high level architectural view of the end-to-end -end workflow. So let's swap over into my demonstration. I'll just show some examples of what I have here. So first is the, the stateful services. So we have a login page and one great way to kick off a session in a web-based architecture is to leverage a sign-in use case. So no traditional authentication in my demo example here, but I'll just put in a username and I'll call it webinar and it will be of type customer. So in this case, this is our session and we can have additional session related information such as the, the last page the user was on or uh, various click tracking and aggregate information for web analytics, but in our case, we'll keep it simple. So under the covers, what's gonna happen is our user is initiating a request to our web-based uh, microservices application, which is using the session store microservice to get and post sessions to Amazon Elasticash. So when I do that, that's exactly what's happening. We're persisting that session into Amazon Elasticash. So if, for instance, one of my nodes is removed, and that may be on this, this, uh, this light blue character here, I can very easily and seamlessly be rerouted to Amazon Elasticash session-based uh, data by just doing a simple get post or get request from Amazon Elasticash. So I, my my workflow is not disrupted at all by by the fact that these pods in my example are coming and going within my cluster. So that's just one quick example. The next one I wanted to talk through was just caching and data stores. So. In our example, we had the traditional caching use case. So let's say we have our profile microservice here. Actually, th this is the, the front end that is communicating with the profile microservice. And we're going to use API Gateway to create a profile. And at that time, it's going to set some information in our cache. It's also going to insert into the database. But what we reviewed was how event sourcing could actually play a role in this architecture. So this time we're gonna create a profile and in our case profile is simply just an address. And what we'll do is persist that data to DynamoDB and also emit an event which can populate really any underlying data store, but for simplicity's sake, we're using Amazon Elasticache as the cache. So that event will be consumed by an event broker and the event broker will populate the cache. This is traditionally known as a right behind caching architecture, but accommodated within microservices architecture. So I'll just put in my address here in Boston and I'll hit submit. So when I do that, and we can go to, to DynamoDB over here and just look at some examples. So we were profile ID webinar, and we can see that that data was of course persisted into Dynamo. And also, if I go back, I can see that if I refresh, the data is continuously retrieved. And if you think about the architecture, the reads of that data are going to happen from Amazon Elasticash. So you start to see some of the end-to-end -end communication. Now, I happen to have a fallback in my code, which is reading from Dynamo in the event that I can't find the item in the cache. But that's uh, more of an exception case than the preferred route. So again, seeing how these data access architectures can be adjusted, in our case, by breaking up how the data is being written 
as well as being read. So we'll submit through, and then we can see we're going to get into more of the event store related communication. So we have a very simple page, which is responsible for creating orders. And when we create orders, we'll persist that data into Amazon RDS, as well as as a cache for Amazon ElastiCache. But we'll also emit an event, and that event will be written to a Amazon ElastiCache for Redis stream. And that stream will then be processed by the delivery microservice, which will run its own business logic, completely separate from the service or even the Redis stream to say whether the event was created successfully or created with an exception. So at that time, it will process that orders and it can actually emit an event back to Redis, which can be consumed by the microservice, uh, order microservice. So if we look at our location here, let's say that we're in Boston and we want a total of 1,000 widgets for simplicity's sake, and we place that order, we can see that it's just in a status of created. We don't really know necessarily that the delivery microservice is available. We don't know that it can process the event. And of course, we can introduce more business rules and validation into this process. However, we're treating this very asynchronously. So what's happening is we've created the event. It's then been picked up by the delivery microservice. And then that delivery microservice is telling us this was a success or this was an ex exception. And in fact, the, the code to power this is so simple as just using a random function to say, this was success or this was uh, an exception. So if I refresh, we can see that the status changed from created to success. And that happened completely in the background because it was done by a completely separate service. So I'll run it quickly again in case you missed it. This time we'll do New York City for a total of 1,001 widgets. We place the order. And again, you see the status is created. So we're, we're emitting that event. The, the workers of the delivery microservice are picking that up. It's processing the data and then coming back eventually to the order microservice to say, hey, this was successful. And then I can update my own underlying data store when I get that event. And when I refresh, we can see that the status was changed to success. So just a little bit behind the scenes here, I have Amazon EKS running. So if I get my nodes, for instance, I can see this is powered by various EC2 nodes. I have these, this code base packaged in various containers, such as the delivery microservice, the order microservice, the profile, the sessions. I can get my pods. I can see that my pods are running and they happen to just have one pod uh, per service. And you see the delivery microservice running, the order microservice, sessions, profile, and the web tier. And also I have Amazon ElastiCache running here and we see examples such as the stream, um, the stream commands being run through Amazon ElastiCache. And we already saw Amazon DynamoDB as one way to store the, the persistent data within our architectures. So I'll just transition back here as we, as we wrap up our presentation. So very quickly, I wanted to touch on some additional use cases or areas where we've seen Amazon ElastiCache be leveraged within microservices architecture. So API rate limiting, for instance, if I'm creating lots of calls to the order microservice, maybe a thousand per second, we know there's no reason that a user should create a thousand orders per second we can introduce API rate limiting into the architecture. And we've seen some really interesting patterns with Lua scripts, for instance, to be able to power the logic to say, hey, this user has created too many API requests in the last five seconds or the last 10 seconds as examples. Another interesting use case is service discovery. So just as these services are available or unavailable, we can actually start to track that and ensure that if we're making lots of calls to a particular service and we want to understand whether or not it's available prior, we can use Amazon ElastiCache for Redis as an in-memory low latency way to retrieve data such as whether or not the service is available. And also as a configuration data store. So of course, lots of configuration and deployment is required to have various communication channels within your service. So for instance, the configuration data store could hold reference to what DynamoDB table to update 
for instance. And if that changes, I can, I can do that very quickly and change that reference. Maybe it's an, an endpoint or a port number or some sort of communication between the services. And I don't want to introduce latency, so I can leverage Redis as a way to share that data. And then uh, more, more generically, real-time analytics of so web ingestion. We saw an example with the profile microservice, which is being plugged into uh, an analytics worker. It could create metadata such as how many profiles are being created per, per minute or per hour, uh, as a simple example. And the leaderboards are a traditional use case of Redis, but I think this highlights how various Redis data structures can be leveraged for specific reasons. So of course, if you're coming from the gaming industry and you need to create leaderboards and you're thinking, well, what's a good technology to store that? And Amazon Elasticash for Redis and Redis in general have a really interesting data structure called sorted set, which can do exactly that. And, and leaderboard can take different contexts depending on your industry. So even extending beyond gaming, thinking about task-based priority queues or even event registration. These are all just ways that sort of set can be leveraged. But again, thinking about how technology decisions can be independent, you get the ability to choose whether or not a data structure or an engine like Redis is right for your microservice. But hopefully in this presentation, you're starting to realize there are really great ways to leverage Redis in these architectures. And finally, job queues. We saw the read a stream as an append only log structure, but also job queues so that could be leveraged in order to, to process orders, particularly synchronously and in order job queues, such as the list data structure would be a good choice. But again, that, that's more for your application related requirements. So as we wrap up here, I also wanted to share some really interesting ways that Amazon Elasticash for Redis is being really integrated with container orchestration platforms like uh, Kubernetes. So uh, one way this is coming to fruition is through the AWS controller for Kubernetes, otherwise known as ACK, and the Amazon Elasticash for Redis uh, support, which is in developer preview at the moment. So if you have a Kubernetes background, you, you might be aware of the fact that you need to create resources independently of your, of your clusters, and this may I guess, reduce the amount of uh, integration between the two resources. So resources running on AWS, such as Elasticash or SQS or RDS, and the, the cluster itself. So what AWS controllers for Kubernetes allows is a, a tighter integration between the two, which allows you to create and manage resources from the Kubernetes control plane, so kubectl as well as perform cluster scaling and uh, automatic drift detection and remediation within these Kubernetes environments. So this is implemented using uh, custom resource definitions within the, the Kubernetes API. So in case you're coming from the heavy containers background and interested in microservices and how Amazon Elasticash can be integrated into some of these architectures, this is a real, one really great way that we're, we're seeing this come uh, come available. So this is currently in developer preview. So we, we encourage you to, to get hands on by, by testing this out. So finally, I just wanted to share some resources and areas where you can learn more about Amazon Elasticash for Redis particularly. We have a lot of really great content and presentations and discussion on Redis as a technology. We, we took a very deep dive into microservices and how Redis can play a role. But in case you're wanting to learn more about the value proposition of Amazon Elasticash or Redis, how it can be leveraged in beyond microservices just in general, we have a lot of really great resources. So of course, AWS FAQs to understand what Amazon Elasticash for Redis can do as a managed service. We have the blogs where we're learning a lot about how customers are leveraging Amazon Elasticash for Redis in various architectures, and we're sharing that and best practice patterns and ways to leverage Elasticash. And then we have our forum and getting started resources. And also, I just want to encourage you to check out the learning path, which goes in much longer form content around how to leverage lots of different features and functionalities of Amazon Elasticash, such as the clustered architecture, scalability aspects, high availability, security, 
Amazon Elasticash for Redis Global Data Store, and just a, a, a variety of data access patterns such as caching strategies. So highly encourage you to, to check those out. And finally, before we wrap here, I of course want to say thank you for, for listening in on this presentation here today. It was really great getting a chance to discuss this topic. And we're particularly interested in understanding in greater detail how Amazon Elasticash for Redis can be leveraged within your microservices architecture. So uh, again, thank you so much. It was really great getting a chance to do this. So uh, take care and, and bye now.